you should really think about going, you know? I mean, it's like your own, own personal twilight zone. You see everybody at graduation, and then pow. Bye, <laughs> stink. Uh, Robert, it was your first time teaching. Yeah? Well, the supervisor said it may be my last. <laughs> Sometimes it's the folks behind the camera that don't know their place. I think you are the most beautiful woman on the face of the earth. And I know... <laughs> I must have some <laughs> she goes, Here it is, I got it. Yeah. But whatever goes wrong, the cast and crew members help each other out no matter what. Even the littlest members pitch in. I deduct our fixed costs, and then I figure out what we have to service our debt. Now, whatever leftovers... Sorry. <laughs> whatever money's left over. Whatever money's left over. Thanks for watching our backstage look at Everybody Loves Raymond. We hope you loved this special. You know, at E, they live for this stuff. Me, I kind of like it too. I'm lonely. <laughs> A lot of the people who work here have become my very good friends. And I just love them to death and, and I couldn't do the show without them. They bring so much to my life in addition to the show. It's just been this wonderful, great experience for me. Kind of funny. I mean, I, I defend. Like, what are you going to defend on this page? The devil is a funny word. Devil it is. Oh, I'm not not funny to a lot of people, but in this, this context, get, in this context, do I have very to funny. get the Phil, pepper spray? Very, are you going to argue with me? I'm not arguing. I'm just saying this is very funny. I think this is funny. I, I don't know. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. You know, I never like to do that. Would you hire a male escort? I'm a love machine, baby. Ally McBeal did. Hi. Tonight at 9 on Fox 2. We are out of time. Thanks for joining us. Hope to see you back here tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, no, scroll down. I hate to go back a couple of pages, but um, who's speaking to me? I am. Just keep reading, scroll. Just keep reading. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy. No, it's okay. But, oh, before I forget, who's coming over the house Sunday? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're having a little barbecue, out. right? Yeah. Good, good. I think you're a very sexy man. We spark together talking. If you were an old drone, I would be sitting here like an old drone, too. But you're an exciting man, and the sex is very important. Jacqueline Suzanne wrote torrid, racy novels with plots that made readers blush. I was kind of shocked when I read it. I thought it was trashy and sleazy. Suzanne's most celebrated novel, Valley of the Dolls, was a sexy saga filled with pill-popping babes, booze, and lewd behavior. She had a genius for writing about tragedy in a way that was pop and camp and over the top, and you kind of wanted to be tragic. But it couldn't escape the critics' wrath. She's no William Faulkner, she's no Hemingway. Jackie's personal life was as extravagant and salacious as one of her books. We didn't think of it as being hooked on pills, but we all took sleeping pills. In the next hour, we'll meet Jacqueline Suzanne, who started as a B actress with a little talent, but a lot of ambition. I've never done anything like this before. Really, I haven't. Believe me. We'll watch Jackie transform into a best-selling writer. In that first week that it was out, it sold over four million copies. We'll examine her unconventional marriage and brilliant partnership with Irving Mansfield. They saw themselves as Katherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy. And finally, we'll share Jacqueline Suzanne's tragic fight for her life. Jackie's success coincides, sadly, with her knowledge that her time was limited and she was going to die. This is the story of the pop culture diva, 
This is the story of Jacqueline Suzanne, the E! True Hollywood story. One hot day in the summer of 1936, an 18 year old girl from Philadelphia climbed on a train headed for New York City. She was armed with a cheap trophy won in a beauty contest and dreams of stardom. Her name was Jacqueline Suzanne. Feminist writer and author of the Jacqueline Suzanne biography, Lovely Me, Barbara Seaman. Her mother wanted her to get a good education and become a teacher or a writer. But her father loved glamorous women, beautiful women. And so she decided to be an actress because it was more to please her father, to get her father's attention. Jackie was an only child from a prominent Philadelphia family. Her father, Robert Suzanne, was a charming rogue with a successful career as a portrait painter. As a little girl, Jackie idolized her father and acted as an accomplice in many of his adventures. He would send her to a movie while he was spending an afternoon uh, with one of his mistresses and then he um, would have her tell him the details of the movie <laughs> so that he could pretend he had gone to the movie too. Jackie recorded every detail of her life in her diary. Even as a little girl she made frequent entries into it and as time passed she um, she always kept up her diaries. Like her father, Jackie was a free spirit and she was also smitten with show business. 15-year-old Jackie's first foray into acting was trying to land a role on a local radio program. The woman who ran it said that Jackie was just a terrible actress, but Jackie would sometimes write her own skits, and she said they were marvelous, and she used to say to Jackie, just keep on writing, keep on writing, and you will make it in show business, but as a writer. But a writer's life seemed too dull for Jackie. Upon graduation from West Philadelphia High School in 1936, 18-year-old Jacqueline Suzanne moved to New York City to pursue an acting career. Jackie was passionate about acting, but she was self-conscious about her weight. She felt she had to stay thin because she wanted to have a career as an actress. She had to take the operas to give her sparkle. She had to take the sleeping pills to help her sleep. Pills became as routine as casting calls and auditions for the budding actress. It was mostly failure, but she was so persistent that from time to time she would get parts. Jackie had little luck as an actress, but was a brilliant social climber. Charismatic and good-looking, she gravitated to Broadway life and cafe society. In 1937, a young press agent named Irving Mansfield eyed Jackie in a New York night spot friend Penny Bigelow. He told me that he walked in one night uh, with a friend of his uh, who knew her and he said that's the most beautiful girl I've ever seen. 28 year old Irving and 18 year old Jackie started dating. Irving was steady and reliable and had numerous show business connections. The couple soon became fixtures in New York nightlife. He started getting her picture in the papers, he helped her to get her name in the columns and he was 10 years older than she was. He was making a good living, and I don't think she was ever passionately in love with him, but I think she felt very comfortable with him. In November 1938, Irving asked Jackie to marry him, and she accepted. Publicist and friend Abby Hirsch. They saw themselves as Katharine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy. They also knew what they were doing in each other's relationship in the relationship to each other. Irving was the producer of all of it. Jackie was the talent. Jackie Suzanne and Irving Mansfield were married on April 2nd, 1939. The most prophetic wedding gift the couple received was a portable typewriter. But the typewriter was destined to gather dust while Jackie continued her quest for fame on the stage. Coming up, Jackie's greatest creation is her greatest tragedy. He was diagnosed as being autistic. In those days, nobody even knew what autistic was.
it captivated the world. The evidence gives us perhaps two, three, maybe even four scenarios. But the trial was obscured by race, stardom, and a questionable investigation. Now E puts the focus back on the facts. I saw a dark figure. We didn't have a classic alibi. With a startling new timeline, new theories, and an exclusive interview with O.J. Simpson. The Nicole I knew was just my whole life. O.J., Nicole, and Ron. Countdown to murder. Tomorrow at 8 on the E! True Hollywood Story. Can you believe the price of popcorn? It's a crime against humanity. Everything costs an arm and a leg. Yeah, not everything. You can get all your long-distance calls for under a buck. He's talking about 10, 10, 2, 20. Dial it and talk over 20 minutes for only 99 cents. You're very wise, tiny one. Talk over 20 minutes, then what? Yeah, and then what? It's just 10 cents for each extra minute. That's cheap. How is it possible? How does popcorn pop? Who cares? Yeah, just dial 10, 10, 2, 20. And talk over 20 minutes for only 99 cents. Bingo. You're not going to hurt me, are you, Norman? <laughs> Big night out. <laughs> Even bigger problem. I needed a pad. M only had tampons. Tampons? Playtex. Playtex Gentle Glide. Gentle Glide. And I'm thinking, is this going to be comfortable? And M says, why wear a pad that feels like a diaper? <laughs> no way. Nothing protects quite like Playtex Gentle Glide because its unique design adjusts to comfort fit your body. No pad, not even the thinnest ones, can do that. Playtex Gentle Glide tampons. So comfortable, you can't even feel them. <laughs> more power and more room than the BMW 528i. Not to mention some unique safety features. Beautiful car. From Volvo. Eleven blue plaid warriors stand on the brink of battle and ask themselves, where is the other team? Ruben, on a Sunday afternoon. Nothing helps you kick back at the end of the day like Tostitos chips and salsa. I can't imagine anything. We do suggest you actually better. wait till the end of the day. He's a fine dancer, too. Dig in, kick back with new Hint of Lime Tostitos. Enter the William Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream sweepstakes for your chance to experience the charm and romance of England. Watch coming attractions all this week for more details. In 1939, two and a half years after stepping off a train in New York City, Jackie Suzanne snagged a husband, but stardom eluded her. Three years later, her career still wasn't going anywhere, and her marriage was nearly over. They went their separate ways, and that's when Jackie had all these romances. In 1941, after 24-year-old Jackie landed a few small roles in off-Broadway productions, she found herself unemployed once again. Restless, Jackie decided to become more involved in the career of her press agent husband, Irving Mansfield. She set out to charm comedian Eddie Cantor so Irving could win him over as a client. Cantor, though married, seduced the star-struck Jackie into his bed. Jackie's reward was earning a small role in Banjo Eyes, a musical starring Cantor. His wife apparently found out about it and she tracked them down in a hotel room and uh, she gave him an ultimatum. Cantor closed banjo eyes and returned to his family. The fiasco left Jackie with a shaky marriage. In early 1943, just before Irving went into the army, the couple separated. Neither one of them really knew how to be married, and uh, especially Jackie, who was about 18 when she got married. And uh, the marriage was not working at all. They were not comfortable, they were not happy in it. While Irving was stationed in New Jersey, Jackie landed a role in a touring production of the play, Cry Havoc. While she was on the road, uh, she began an affair with Joey Lewis, whom she'd had sort of a crush on since she first came to New York. She just was very enchanted with him. Jackie's relationship with the comedian was serious, but short-lived. A series of forgettable affairs followed. Then, Irving returned home in late 1943. They'd worked out a lot of their misunderstandings and differences and decided to stay together. It took time for, for this uh, relationship to really develop, but once they became a team, they were welded, they were joined at the hip. In 1945, 
27-year-old Jackie dusted off the typewriter she had ignored. Jackie and friend Beatrice Cole collaborated on a play they called The Temporary Mrs. Smith. By spring of 1946, Jackie's life seemed to be falling into place. Not only had she found a producer to back her play, but Jackie discovered she was pregnant. In November 1946, the temporary Mrs. Smith debuted in Philadelphia. It opened in 1946, just after the war, when there was a huge shortage of Broadway theaters. And they just hadn't lined up a secure space in a theater so that they could keep it running. Despite sellout crowds, the play closed after only 37 performances. But Jackie's disappointment was tempered by the joys of motherhood. On December 6, 1946, she gave birth to a son, Guy Hildy Mansfield. When Guy was born, he was a beautiful, beautiful baby and a beautiful child. But by the time Guy was two, he began having uncontrollable outbursts. He would have these tantrums, uh, which jo drove Jackie crazy because she couldn't figure out why he was carrying on so or what was making him so uh, unhappy. By the time he was three, he was completely un unmanageable. He, he had stopped talking. He was in a world of his own. In a frantic effort to find out what was wrong, Jackie took Guy to several doctors. He was diagnosed as being autistic. In those days, nobody even knew what autistic was. I mean, it was just a, a vague term for a disease that affected one's mind, but nobody really understood it. Autism is a lifelong neurological disorder that causes severe language and communication impairment, usually striking children by the age of two. Jackie reluctantly allowed a doctor to administer shock treatments to three-year-old Guy. His condition only worsened. Jackie was blamed by most of the doctors for the autism, and she started to blame herself, and she got more and more deeply into drugs at, at that point and, and booze to, to comfort herself. In a desperate attempt to save Guy, Jackie decided it was time to strike a deal with a higher power. She said, I made a pact with God. If, if God would just make Guy well, I will do anything, I will be any kind of person he wants me to be, but I, that's the only thing I want in life. But Guy never improved, and by early 1950, Jackie and Irving made the decision to have their four-year-old son institutionalized. Friend, Sherry Arden. It definitely was, you know, a, a deep, deep, deep pain in her heart that she never got over, never. But the experience drew Jackie and Irving closer. They really were extremely devoted to each other as the years passed. And particularly after they had to put Guy away, they, they really bonded over that tragedy. Jackie refused to give up hope that Guy would one day be a normal little boy. To keep her fantasy intact, she fabricated a story. She started lying that he was in school in Arizona uh, for asthma, and then she just sort of had to keep up the lie. Coming up, Jackie and her dolls. I found out the dolls were the sleeping pills. From George of the Jungle. He works incredibly hard. To Gods and Monsters. Oh, boy, is he gorgeous. He's Hollywood's new hunk with an impressive body of work. He's going to be with us for the rest of our lives as a major actor. In an exclusive interview, Brendan Fraser reveals how he coped with sudden success. No, no pressure at all. Here, Brendan, here's a loincloth. <laughs> and offers insight into his passion for acting. I felt it like aching deep in my bones. Real stars, real stories. Brendan Fraser Celebrity Profile. This Wednesday at 8, only on E! Be the first in line to own the hit video about love online. Do you think we should meet? <gasps> You've got mail. She's beautiful, but she's a pill. Oh. Tom Hanks, Meg Ryan. Now for sale on video and DVD. Also look for the hit soundtrack. Oh. I'm Joe Boxer and I'll be brief. We need a cure for breast cancer. For John Armando's Concept Cure, I designed the Chevy Venture Taxi. You can win, pledge, and enter. Let's stop breast cancer in its tracks. Am I the only person on the planet without a wireless phone? Okay, I know I have to get on the internet. Okay, but how do you get on that thing anyways? And if I have email, do I need voicemail? How much mail does a person actually need? There's a Sprint store and over 5,000 radio shacks. Okay, I can answer all that. But there's one thing I need you to do. What? Breathe. 
It's not just about how close we are to where you live. It's about how close we can get to the way you live. Isn't that the point of contact? Who wore what to all the other award shows? Find out on E's World of Awards Fashion Review, Saturday at 3, only on E. I'll see you. Hi, man. Me too. Me too? Ah, the credit card game. We've all played it. I'll go 5.9%. That an intro rate? Yeah. First, you get a great introductory rate, but then it goes up. So you'll raise us to 17.9% in six months? Yeah. But now, if you have good credit, you can win the credit card game by calling 1-800-235-2266. Let's make it interesting. I'm out. I'm out. I'll call. With a 9.9% fixed rate Visa Platinum card from Capital One. Fixed? That's a great hand. It's not an introductory rate. You get a low fixed rate you can trust, platinum perks, and no annual fee. Act now. Call 1-800-235-2266. Transfer your high interest balances to the 9.9% fixed rate Visa Platinum from Capital One and save hundreds, even thousands of dollars a year. Call 1-800-235-2266 and win the credit card game. Jacqueline Suzanne was heartbroken by her son's autism, but a creative outlet as a writer would soon emerge, with help from a poodle named Josephine. She came home with this tiny little poodle. She walked in with it, and Irving looked at it and he said, what's that? In the summer of 1950, 32-year-old Jackie was suffering intense feelings of guilt about her institutionalized son. Her career was also languishing, but Jackie's husband, Irving Mansfield, had become a high-powered television producer. Penny Bigelow was Irving's production assistant. Irving was one of the uh, two or three top producers at CBS, and he did all variety and comedy shows, and every show that he did there, or just about every show that he did at CBS, was a tremendous hit. Jackie wasn't satisfied as the wife of a television producer. Friend Lily Cates remembers Jackie's frustration. Irving was a great provider. He was a famous producer. Uh, it was not monetary. Jackie's a woman who lived, you know, the way she wanted. But she wanted to do something for herself on her own. She was very intent on, on her career her acting career at that time, which was not very much. I mean, she was not really not a very good actress. She got bit parts on some of these uh, recurring TV drama shows. She said she was always usually the murder victim. <laughs> so she'd be in for one scene and then... No! You stupid broad! You know, I don't know what she really thought, but she sure as hell kept trying. By 1952, 34-year-old Jackie began to rely on an increasing number of dolls to get through the nights. I found out the dolls were the sleeping pills. Because I remember being at the Beverly, I said, you know, I couldn't sleep last night because there was a party going on. He says, don't worry about it. Take this and you will sleep. I remember taking one of those, um, I believe it was a second all, and sleeping. We didn't think of it as being hooked on pills, but we all took sleeping pills. And um, nobody thought of it as an addiction. Jackie's search for a creative outlet continued unabated. She pursued TV roles and managed to have her name pop up in New York society pages. As 1954 began, Jackie found a new obsession, a poodle named Josephine. Josephine was Jackie's baby. This was, Josephine, first of all, was adorable. I mean, she was, she used to call her the Elizabeth Taylor of poodles. One weekend, her mother was visiting from Philadelphia and I was sitting and talking to her mother, and Jackie picked the dog up and started petting it and kissing it and took it into the kitchen for some snacks. And her mother looked at me very sadly and said, isn't it a shame she have, has to give all that love to the, to the dog? Meaning that what a shame it was that the guy wasn't there for her to give all that love to. While her motherly instincts were fulfilled by Josephine, Jackie still pined for acting fame. In 1956, 38-year-old Jackie finally got her big break. She became the spokeswoman on Shifley embroidery commercials. She would write the copy herself. She would go out and find the, you know, pick what product she was going to use. So she was producing it 
producing them as well as acting them. It was a lot of work, and she was very good at it. A year after landing the Shifley contract, Jackie received devastating news. On April 3, 1957, her beloved father, Robert Suzanne, died at the age of 70. His death marked a major transition point in Jackie's life. In 1960, 42 year old Jackie met Ethel Merman, the queen of Broadway musicals. The two women formed an intense friendship, and rumors flew that they were having an affair. Jackie had a big crush on Ethel. Some people thought that it wasn't reciprocated, but B'nai Venuta, who was Ethel's closest friend, uh, told me that it was reciprocated. They were both really fascinated with each other. Others believe the whole notion of an affair is ridiculous. Ethel Merman was a very simple woman. She wouldn't have known a lesbian if she fell over her. And the idea of she and Jackie having been lovers was totally absurd. Actress Sally Kirkland, who starred in the television series Valley of the Dolls, sums it up this way. She had these volatile friendships with her women friends, and um, who knows all the rumors, but it's, it's like, who cares? It makes for great theater, doesn't it? In 1961, Jackie's contract with Shifley was coming to an end. The 43-year-old Jackie began to pay attention to her instincts. The little voice in the background saying, give up on this acting nonsense. You know you're never going to make it. But you are a great storyteller. Jackie's friends encouraged her to write a book based on stories about her dog, Josephine. When Jackie started writing, put her mind to it and really sat down and started writing, I was not surprised. By the fall of 1962, Jackie completed her poodle book, titled Every Night, Josephine. Jackie took the manuscript to a literary agent who passed it on to executives at Doubleday. Jackie was, was all excited that Doubleday was supposed to take it, but hadn't been given a date when it co would come out. And she decided to take her mother on a trip around the world while she was waiting because she was so nervous about it. Jackie was on the brink of becoming a published writer. She only hoped that her dreams wouldn't be crushed again. Coming up, Jackie's rage to live spawns another lie. It was an awful thing for her to keep the secret about cancer. She really didn't share it with anyone. Ian's a jazz saxophonist getting ready for a benefit homecoming performance. But will hitting the right notes in fashion help him hit home with his audience? It's E's Fashion Emergency, hosted by Emmy, tomorrow at 6.30 Eastern and Pacific, only on E. He was the king of the silent screen and Hollywood's first male sex symbol. But off screen, this Latin lover was no Casanova. Mysteries and Scandals premieres Rudolph Valentino tomorrow at 7.30. Only on E. Fame ain't the bitch. You know it makes me want to shout. New Shout now has more tough stain fighters than ever. And gets out more tough stains, better than spray and wash, in just one try. Want more tough stains out the first time? Shout them out. SC Johnson, a family company. I'm Steve Kirby. These are my mountains. I test emissions for Ford Motor Company. We're up here in the Rockies testing Ford, Lincoln, and Mercury sport utility vehicles. We're really concerned about the environment. Every SUV we sell this year is going to be low emissions. These vehicles average 35% less smog forming emissions than the government requires. 35%? That's really amazing. The government doesn't make us do this. We're doing this for my mountains. Better ideas driven by you. to go. Mudslides, White Russians, B-52s, they keep the party going. At ERA, we believe real estate isn't just about property. It's about people, understanding their needs, doing whatever it takes. It's giving the Bennetts something to celebrate. We used ERA.com to find a buyer for their old house and our national referral network to find them a new one. 
It's assuring the Jordans that we will sell their house or ERA will buy it. Every time we help someone buy or sell a home, we help write a new chapter in their lives. ERA Real Estate. These are great. I can't believe they actually came out. Yeah, they could have been a real disaster. Our honeymoon. It rained. It was romantic. It rained. It was exotic. It rained. Come on. With Kodak Max, you'll never miss a moment. It's the film that captures action in rain or shine. We had some sun. Yeah, the day we left. Sunlight, low light, action, or still. Kodak Max. It's all you need to know about film. Disney's Beauty and the Beast, now celebrating its fifth anniversary season on Broadway and starring the Adora Bell, Andrea McArdle. Call Ticketmaster, 212-307-4747. In 1962, Jackie Suzanne waited anxiously for her first book, Every Night Josephine, to be published. Fame loomed, but so did tragedy. She said, this, they'll say to me, oh, she's the woman that had cancer or that's got cancer, and she didn't want that. And that was the reason that she wouldn't tell anybody. In October 1962, while her husband Irving maintained his hectic schedule as a bi-coastal TV producer, Jackie embarked on a vacation around the world with her mother, Rose. As the trip was ending, 44-year-old Jackie made a terrifying discovery. She was in the shower and she felt this lump. And so her mother thought that it was important enough for her to call their doctor in New York, which she did, and the doctor thought it... Uh, was important enough for them to cut their trip short and fly back. The doctor tried to um, collapse it with a needle and it didn't collapse so she had to go into the hospital and uh, see whether it was cancer. As she had done since she was a girl, Jackie wrote her thoughts down in her diary. The night before she went into the hospital she made the most beautiful entries in her diary. She said, one other dream beside Irving must come true. <laughs> and, um, and she said, I, I think I can write. Let me live to make it. On Christmas Day, 1962, Jackie was admitted to Doctors Hospital in New York City for a biopsy. In those days, they made women uh, sign a consent form. They'd be knocked out, and without being awakened to discuss it, they would lock off the breast. Well, Jackie wouldn't have it as upset and desperate as she was, she uh, told the doctor she was not going to sign a consent form, that whatever he found, he would have to wake her up and uh, discuss it with her. The biopsy revealed a malignant tumor in her right breast, but Jackie convinced the doctor to perform a modified radical mastectomy, a procedure which would not remove underlying healthy muscle. Still, Jackie kept the surgery to herself. In those days, people did not say a great deal about cancer. It was mostly a terrible, dark secret. And uh, Jackie decided that uh, if everybody knew that she had cancer, that she'd, she would be the focal point of a, a lot of pity. Pity was something that Jackie wouldn't tolerate, even from her husband. One evening, she was taking a bath, and Irving walked into the bathroom, and she grabbed a washcloth and went like this, and he kneeled beside the bathtub and he pulled it away and he kissed her on the scar and he said, Jackie, I'm not in love with your breast. I'm in love with you. As Jackie recovered from surgery, she waited to hear if Doubleday would publish Every Night Josephine. Unsure of her future, Jackie decided to strike another deal with God. She asked for 10 more years to live. She would make him an offer he can't refuse. With God, we're talking about, you know, you want to discuss it with the Pope? with God. Now that takes a certain kind of spirit. Jackie's newfound commitment to life was tested after Doubleday executives rejected Every Night Josephine. Undaunted, she took her manuscript to publisher Bernard Geis. It was a book full of life, humor, and it made you feel better, not only about dogs, but about your own life. Geist decided to take a chance on Every Night Josephine. He put Jacqueline to work with editor Jackie Farber. Jackie Suzanne came in all decked out in a poochie. I never saw her in anything but a poochie. And if you said to her, Jackie, that's a beautiful dress, she would say, isn't it? Just feel it. She would make you feel the fabric. On November 14, 1963, 
Every Night Josephine was published. Best we did was number 10 on the Time magazine list. We never made the New York Times, but it was quite a successful book. Bernard Geis was a tremendous promoter. I mean, that was part of what his company was based on, so there was a huge amount of publicity to, be, to go on when the book was published. In November 1963, Jackie was scheduled to begin a book tour, but on November 22nd, the tour was abruptly postponed. That was the month that Kennedy was assassinated. And everybody had been out to lunch. We all came back to the office. And when we got back to the office, Jackie was dissolved in tears. She was sitting in the publicity director's office, sobbing her eyes out. And we said to her, Jackie, for heaven's sakes, you know, don't take it so hard. And she said, don't take it so hard. She said, my tour's been canceled. But nothing could stop Jackie. With the moderate success of Every Night Josephine, she went right back to her typewriter. One day I received a phone call from Jacqueline Suzanne's literary agent, and Annie Larry Williams said, don't laugh, Mr. Geis, but Jackie is writing a novel. Coming up, Jackie becomes the queen of Pulp Fiction. Wherever I went with her, people asked her for autographs. It captivated the world. The evidence gives us perhaps two, three, maybe even four scenarios. But the trial was obscured by race, stardom, and a questionable investigation. Now E puts the focus back on the facts. I saw a dark figure. We didn't have a classic alibi. With a startling new timeline, new theories, and an exclusive interview with O.J. Simpson. The Nicole I knew was just my whole life. O.J., Nicole, and Ron. Countdown to murder. Tomorrow at 8 on the E! True Hollywood Story. Hello. Is this phone clear? Well, that depends on your definition of clarity. What? Clear like this? Or this? Or clear like this? Sprint PCS gives you the clarity of the nation's only 100% digital, 100% PCS network, built from the ground up. And the simplicity of the new free and clear plan, including free long distance. Great, I'll take it. Sprint PCS, the clear alternative to cellular. Robin and I are going to Cooperstown together, and nobody's going to care that I got 98% of the vote and you only got 77. Yeah, just like nobody's going to care I won more MVP awards, George. We'll be too busy celebrating with Miller Lite, which tastes great because it's so smooth. Well, I think it tastes great because of the choice hot. Are you sure about that, Robin? Yeah, I'm sure. 98% sure or just 77% sure? <laughs> Miller Lite, the great taste of a true Pilsner beer. That MVP thing's killing you, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. The new Saturn Coupe has better pickup than a Maserati. After a Little League game, anyway. The world's first three-door coupe from Saturn. Why didn't anyone think of this before? Adrenaline rushing. Hearts pounding, heavy breathing. It's almost as much fun as your first date. Royal Caribbean, like no vacation on earth. Get together with two new fragrances from Emporio Armani, for him, for her. And to find out where celebrities get together in New York, log on to eonline.com slash Armani. If you're going to write, Write what you know, and that's just what Jackie Suzanne did. The resulting novel made publishing history. It was like a Ouija board. It was coming along, characters would spring up. I had to write, I had to say it. In February 1963, just two months after her mastectomy, Jackie scribbled the working title of her second novel, Valley of the Dolls. For the next two years, Jackie chained herself to her typewriter. I decided to write Valley of the Dolls. I wanted to write it long before I wrote Every Night Josephine. I've grown up with show business. I've seen people 
become starry-eyed, and I've seen them hope to climb Mount Everest, as I call it, which is the top. And I've seen many of them go into the Valley of the Dolls. Her story centered around three young career girls and their bed-hopping, pill-popping misadventures in New York City. In January 1965, Jackie delivered her 1,000-page manuscript to Geist Publishing. I was kind of shocked when I read it. I thought it was trashy and sleazy and no one was going to buy it. Former editor-in-chief Don Preston. And Bernie asked me to read it and asked Jackie to read it and we both came back in horrified and said this thing is a piece of absolute trash. I took the manuscript home and asked my wife Darlene to read it and uh, she read it and she said you know I felt as if I'd picked up the phone and I was listening to two women discussing how their husbands were in bed and she said, I couldn't hang up on a conversation like that, and I couldn't stop reading this manuscript. You've got to publish it. On April 15, 1965, Jackie signed a contract with Geist Publishing. Don Preston was assigned the complex task of editing Jackie's tome. She had been told that I was good at what I did and that she'd better pay attention. And so she did, except that she had a huge ego, and it was difficult sometimes. I can remember a line from the first page of that book that Don Preston worked so hard to get rid of, and it was, New York was an angry, concrete animal that day. The line stayed. Then, arguments ensued about the ending. The ending, which was a very downbeat, gloomy ending. Everybody wanted that changed. But Jackie was adamant about the fate of her characters. She said, no, these people don't have happy endings in their lives. That's not what their world is all about. This is a hard, tough world, and it grinds them down. Finally, there was an issue about the title. They kept saying it'll end up in the toy department. People won't know what this is. It's a book about toys. Valley of the Dolls was published in February 1966. Jackie, her husband Irving, and publisher Bernard Geis developed a unique marketing plan. They launched Jacqueline Suzanne, the unstoppable promotion machine, on a book tour across America. Esther Margolis was head of publicity for Bantam Books, distributors for the paperback version of Valley of the Dolls. Authors had not done tours at that point. Jackie and Irving just loved the idea of it, the idea that you could go city by city just like a performer. With Irving along for the ride, Jackie made guest appearances on every talk show from Johnny Carson to David Frost. They understood the television media and the power of it from the very beginning. From her selling embroidery to Irving knowing every publicist, it was their passion to be out there. Columnist Liz Smith. She once said to me, if you're ever on a talk show where they have other guests, be sure to put your arm back around the chair of the person next to you so when they move to that person, they have to keep you in the shot too. It's the old joke. Uh, Oh, enough talking about me, let's talk about you. What did you think of my last book? And that's what, that's exactly what Jackie was like. Friend and former editor of Cosmopolitan magazine, Helen Gurley Brown. Whenever you saw her in public, she was pretty much done up, as though her public were out there waiting for her, and they usually were. Wherever I went with her, people asked her for autographs. Sherry Arden met Jackie and Irving in 1966 while co-producing the documentary Jacqueline Suzanne and the Valley of the Dolls. It was a team effort and whenever Jackie called me uh, I knew Irving was on, a, on the other phone. It isn't that they try to disguise it, that's just the way it was. Jackie and Irving's hard work paid off. Valley of the Dolls hit number one on May 8, 1966 and held that position for 28 straight weeks. No book had ever sold faster. Uh, then, then Valley of the Dolls. In that first week that it was out, it sold over four million. Dolls became a phenomenon that tapped into the psyche of 1966 America. Contributing editor to Esquire magazine, Mim Yudovich. I think one of the messages of Valley of the Dolls, that the female condition is something that is inherently so painful that it has to be sedated. I had read Valley of the Dolls, and it was kind of glamorous to have a nervous breakdown. Poet and Jacqueline Suzanne archivist David Trinidad had his copy of Valley of the Dolls confiscated. After my mother took it away from me, I think she ended up reading it herself and then passing it on to one of her friends. I went back and bought another copy of the book and snuck it into the house and read it on the sly. While sales for Valley of the Dolls skyrocketed, 
the taboo novel did not escape the wrath of the critics. They rather resented that a woman would write a book that had sex in it. And they began really casting rocks at me, but the more rocks they cast, the bigger the book went. In August 1966, 48-year-old Jackie was flying high on her blockbuster fame. Success is hard for anyone to take, but it was not hard for Jackie. It was very easy for Jackie. It was something she wanted since she'd been a little girl. Coming up, Jackie savors life at the top. Anything is possible. I can accomplish anything as long as I know that Irving Mansfield is my husband. The Oscars are over, but who wore what to all the other award shows? Join Joan and Melissa as they examine the arrivals at the People's Choice Awards. Brooke Shields is over there somewhere. I wanted to see what she was wearing. The SAG Awards. I'm going to go home. The Grammys. How's that my dress look? <laughs> Great. And more. Ah! It's time to talk about red carpet hair and makeup. My mother lives for this stuff. The World of Awards Fashion Review, Saturday at 3, only on E! What if your baby's skin was healthier here? Would he smile more here? What if his diaper let healthy air through here and locked away irritating wetness there? Would he laugh louder here? He might, if his diaper is Huggies Ultra Trim. No diaper protects baby's skin from irritating wetness like Huggies, and that's important for healthy skin. So he may have a little more fun in everything he does. Huggies Ultra Trim, because healthy skin means happy babies. We begin each project the way method actors work. We become the buyer. We became minivan drivers. The new quest grew out of real life issues. And you can smell it in the final product. We designed an immovable rear shelf. It's got dual sliding doors. It's even got a video player for the kids. Happy kids, happy parents. He's Hollywood's new hunk with an impressive body of work. Brendan Fraser, Celebrity Profile, this Wednesday at 8, only on E! Come on, Jimmy! Where's Mom taking us? To buy a copier or printer. Maybe both. Ooh. Yeah, Mom owns her own business. That's a very important job. Yeah, she's really fussy about getting a good deal. This could take forever. This will help. What's this? It's the number for a rebate on a Xerox digital copier printer. It'll save the day. Oh, no. So many choices. Hey! Mom! Look! Xerox. Digital quality copies, digital reliability, the built-in laser printer, too. $449 for Xerox. Wow! The rebate. Oh, yeah. Some guy in a dress said call this number for a rebate. Rebate? Th that means it's only $399. Jimmy! This is not a dress. Yeah, right. Get a $50 rebate certificate only by calling 1-800-392-4695. In 1962, Jacqueline and Suzanne finally listened to the little voice that prodded her to write. The outcome was the best-selling novel, Valley of the Dolls. Four years later, at the age of 48, Jackie was at the height of her fame. As a writer, no one's going to tell me how to write. I'm going to write the way I want to write. In April 1967, 20th Century Fox began production on the film version of Valley of the Dolls. Actresses Barbara Parkins, Patty Duke, and Sharon Tate played the star-crossed women from Jackie's book. The nation's most startling and hotly discussed bestseller, now on the screen with every shock and sensation intact. Dolls, the instant turn-on. For instant love. Instant excitement. Ultimate hell. The film differed significantly from the novel. Jackie hated the changes, including the optimistic ending. She also felt Patty Duke was miscast as Neely O'Hara. But Valley of the Dolls was an instant hit. Jackie was stunned when she went by the theater the day of the New York premiere on December 15, 1967. She said every hooker, every hustler, 
every transvestite was standing in line around the block, and I looked up at Irving and smiled, and I said, these are my people. Jackie had no idea that audiences would become obsessed with the film. I thought it was a, a great movie, and that Patty Duke should win an Oscar as Best Actress for, for her portrayal of Neely O'Hara. And it wasn't until, you know, um, the mid-80s when I saw the movie again that I realized how, how horrible it is. I mean, wonderfully horrible it is. The film eventually attracted a gay audience that raised Valley of the Dolls to cult status. Performance artist and Jacqueline Suzanne impersonator, John Epperson. It's a rite of passage for gay men to see that film and see how other gay men respond to it. Because everyone knows all the lines, they know every scene, they know all the costumes, they know all the musical numbers. By 1968, Jackie was working on her second novel, The Love Machine. Before the book was completed, Jackie landed a sweeter publishing deal at Simon & Schuster. Author and current editor-in-chief Michael Corda was assigned to edit The Love Machine. I'll never forget that she asked me uh, to go to the refrigerator and get a bottle of champagne because they felt that there should always be an open bottle of champagne wherever they were. So I went to the refrigerator and opened it, and in the refrigerator was a bottle of Dom Perignon, a half-empty bottle of cocktail capers, and a can of dog food. Corda immediately became a fan of the quirky author. Underneath all the craziness, the pink typewriter, the pink paper, the fact that when Jackie typed, she hadn't learned where the shift key is on a typewriter, so everything was in capitals, like a telegram. Um, and underneath all that craziness, Jackie was a real pro. She knew, what, she knew what she was doing. Jackie completed The Love Machine in late 1968, and the novel was published in May 1969. The Love Machine was Jackie's second novel and it become another number one bestseller. Hardcover went immediately to the top of the bestseller list. In late summer of 1969, Irving sold the screen rights to The Love Machine for a million and a half dollars. Jackie was asked is, you know, you have everything. What is the thing that you couldn't do without? I can accomplish anything as long as I know that Irving Mansfield is my husband. And without him, I would not be a whole human being. If you're married to a man who loves your work and who will help you succeed in your work, who will enhance your work, that's the biggest love affair going. Whenever she said anything, whenever she did it, the Irving would always go, isn't she great? Isn't Jackie great? Isn't she great? And he meant it. For Jackie and Irving, it was the last of the good times. In October 1972, Jackie completed her third novel, Once Is Not Enough. But her health was seriously deteriorating. What I didn't know at the time was Jackie was, was still afraid of cancer and had cancer. I think Jackie was probably in a lot of pain more often than any of us knew it except for Irving. I knew she was, at times she was ill, she called it emphysema. Um, and she was trying always to give up smoking. But Jackie continued to smoke. She also suffered from a cough she could never shake. On January 11, 1973, Jackie entered Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City to undergo a biopsy in her bronchial area. The result was positive. Jackie had cancer once again. Coming up, Jackie abandons hope. She almost jumped or fell off from the uh, terrace. It was the bus that brought down an automobile mogul. He was just wired, exhausted, desperate. But why did John DeLorean do it? He moved very freely among the, the Hollywood crowd. Was he a power-hungry playboy who craved attention? He liked celebrity. He liked fame. Or just a man fighting to save his failing business? DeLorean did not want to be involved in the drug deal. The story you haven't heard. John DeLorean, next Sunday at 8 on the E! True Hollywood Story.
was missing all sensation of sight It was so dark underground We had seen no light for days What was visible, however, was the enemy For those who combine a passion for living with a passion for living, the Volvo C70 convertible. Good afternoon, heaven. My daughter's marrying a musician. I'll transfer you. Heaven. I'm on fire. Oh, I'll put you right through. Heaven. I need a thousand digital color copies ASAP. Oh, sorry. Need a copy, Miracle? Call Alpha Graphics. Let's see, what's your favorite day? Monday. No. Tuesday. Uh huh. Ah, Wednesday. Yeah, yeah right. right. Here's a hint. These are Friday's Chop House platters. Thick, juicy Chicago style cuts of all your favorites still sizzling from the grill. I love Chicago. The Chop House platters at Friday's. That was good. To it, full-figured gals. Get the biggest news in bras since the 40s. 18 Hours New Comfort Underband. Designed to stay put, stay comfy, no matter how you jump or jive. 18 Hours Comfort Underband. Is that a Playtex under there? Gateway PC with the YourWare program, and you can trade it in toward the purchase of a new one in two years. Mom! So you'll never have an old, slow computer. Call or come in. Get a Gateway Essential PC with an Intel Celeron processor for $28 a month. Hi, I'm Gwyneth Paltrow. I'm Judy Dench. Hi, I'm Jeffrey Rush. And you're watching the Entertainment Television. In 1972, 54-year-old Jacqueline Suzanne finished her third novel, Once Is Not Enough, and looked forward to another bestseller. But Jackie was like Cinderella at the ball. Her fairy tale was about to end. Jackie's success coincides, sadly, with her knowledge that her time was limited and she was going to die. After Once Is Not Enough was published in April 1973, the novel shot straight to the top of the bestseller list. But the news was bittersweet. When Once Is Not Enough first hit the bestseller list, I called her and was screaming and yelling, and I said, oh my God, you're number one again, isn't that fabulous? And she said, Sherry, I can't be happy as I, I can't be as happy as I used to be. It just doesn't mean as much. Jackie's cancer had returned and metastasized in her lungs. Though she was extremely weak, Jackie was determined to go on her book tour. Friends never suspected the extent of Jackie's illness. It was all part of the image. It was an awful thing for her to keep the secret about cancer. because She really didn't share it with anyone. I looked at her and I'd never seen her that thin. And it never occurred to me that it was be caused by cancer or, or chemo or anything. I looked at her and I said, Jackie, you're so thin, it looks fabulous. And she smiled, kind of a weak smile, and she said, yeah, I guess. Once is Not Enough held on to the number one spot through the summer of 1973. By November, the cancer spread to Jackie's liver. Jackie faced the realization that her time was almost gone. She almost jumped or fell off from the t uh, terrace. Uh, Irving just saved her in the nick of time. And at that point, he loved her so much, and he was so alarmed that he actually handcuffed himself to her uh, to make sure that she wouldn't try to jump again. I did not know until she told me herself in June um, of 74, you know, about three, four months before she died. And she and Irving told Oscar Distel, my boss, and I um, that she was ill and that she was dying. And that was a, a shock. It was a total shock. In June 1974, Jackie paid an emotional farewell visit to her 28-year-old son, Guy. On August 21st, Jackie was admitted to Doctor's Hospital in New York City. A month later, on September 21st, 1974, Jacqueline Suzanne passed away at the age of 56. 
Her last words to Irving were, let's get the hell out of here, doll. The press would not believe it. They wanted the name of the doctors at the hospital. They would not take our press release as a fact. Number one, that she had died, because nobody knew she was sick. And two, what she had died of. And we had to, the doctors had to verify it before the New York Times would print it. Irving was now alone after 35 years of marriage to Jackie. I remember seeing Irving Mansfield many years later, walking down the street. And I remember stopping, he looked very old. And he's standing there in the rain and he said, wasn't Jackie great? But over the years, Jackie's books went out of style and out of print. In October 1997, Valley of the Dolls was reissued by Grove Press. Former editor-in-chief, Ira Silverberg. This was one of the great pieces of late 1960s, early 1970s pop culture that disappeared. And in this incredibly retrograde society, it felt like we were ready to bring back Jacqueline Suzanne. By late 1997, Jacqueline, Suzanne, and Valley of the Dolls were everywhere, from web pages to a gala screening of the film in Los Angeles. It made me a little sad, I guess, because there was something wonderful about sort of having her to myself, you know, and, and maybe uh, uh, sharing her with just a few other fanatics. <laughs> I think part of the resurgence is there is a whole new group of people. There are young women in their 20s and 30s picking up this book for the first time and loving it. Jackie Suzanne gave everybody a tragic flaw, but she, but she also gave you permission to laugh at it. And maybe that's a ministry of light right there. We've had plenty of other very successful women writers, but Jackie was the first and she broke the ice and she was just terrific. She really had balls. I know you're not gonna say this on TV, but she did. But even with a comeback, there are always critics. I don't think she's going to have an enduring position in, in the literature of this country or of the world. She's no William Faulkner, she's no Hemingway, she's no Melville or Hawthorne, and she's certainly no Mark Twain. Perhaps not. But the Guinness Book of World Records lists the works of three female writers in a tie for the best-selling novel of all time. Margaret Mitchell's Gone with the Wind, Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird, and Jacqueline Suzanne's Valley of the Dolls. Now she is being studied. There are papers being presented at the popular culture conferences and American studies conferences. She is, is part of a popular culture vernacular now. And what would Jackie have to say about all the fuss? I think Jacqueline Suzanne would be thrilled that everyone's so interested, but I think she would also say, why did it take so long? And why was I forgotten anyway? Sleep with you here in this house. This wonderful old house? And you beside me in that marvelous old four poster upstairs? It's a marriage bed, Lion. You were thinking of marriage. Miriam? I'm pregnant. Oh, Helen, come on. Neely O'Hara can't hurt you. <laughs> you bet your ass she can, because she isn't going to get the chance. Now, the all time bestseller is the motion picture you wanted it to be Valley of the Dolls. Some moms make it all look easy. It's not easy to get this all done. Some look good no matter what they do. I don't understand those women. But the truth is, being a mom and pulling it all together takes a bit of ingenuity and a great deal of work. It's hard to try to look good while you're doing things that aren't exactly very glamorous. Coming up, you'll meet eight amazing moms and moms-to-be and find out their time-saving tips and shortcuts to style from fashion and beauty to health and fitness. It's all in this on style special, Mommy Chic. While most moms have a hard time just figuring out how to fit it all in, some seem to do it rather well and manage to look great in the process. 
I'm amazed. I have some friends that their hair is always blown dry. Their shirts are always tucked into their jeans. These are the same moms that got their jeans on three weeks after their babies were born. Bobby Brown knows firsthand how difficult it really is. As a mother and makeup artist to a number of celebrity moms, she says you have to be realistic when it comes to beauty. If you always need a full face of makeup, you're not going to achieve that or your kids are going to suffer. But that doesn't mean as a good mom, you can't look your best. Bobby says the trick is learning to make the most of your limited time. There's a lot of shortcuts. If you take the time to organize what you have, simplify it, know exactly what's there, your makeup will take you five minutes. It can take you two minutes. Getting dressed and maintaining style is another challenge moms often face. Actress and mother of twin babies, Holly Robinson Pete, is no exception. You're lucky just to get your outfit on, let alone do you have the right, you know, uh, earrings on or is your necklace right or is, you know are you wearing the right hair clips and things like that hey baby Get some water i find myself putting one thing on and leaving it on for the whole day and then looking up at the end of the day going oh my god i'm still wearing this for some moms like designer jill stewart staying on top of style is part of the job as a busy working mom jill's managed to find a way to stay close to her children even during her most hectic time. My first six runway shows, my children walked down the runway and made special dresses for them. They had their hair and their makeup done backstage and they were part of the show and they walked down the runway. It's just our way of sharing, you know, what mommy's been so busy with for the past month. Once fitness expert Kathy Kaler had children, she began working them into her routine. She came up with a fun way to incorporate them into her daily workouts. It's something she suggests for all moms. Some of the exercises use things in your house, like a chair, like a deck of cards, a towel, some uh, elastic bands. Um, and I just think it l allows you to do exercise throughout your day. You don't necessarily have to do it all within an hour, let's say. Finding an hour for anything personal is something few mothers are able to do. But Red Book Magazine's editor-in-chief, Leslie Jane Seymour, has come up with a few tricks to help moms along. You have to find little organizational things that will keep you going and keep you moving in the same direction. Mom and Fox News anchor Paula Zahn is an expert at managing time and balancing career and family. I basically had to schedule my, my deliveries of my children around big stories. I'll never forget being in Havana, Cuba. Uh, basically three and a half weeks before I gave birth to my first child. And I, I knew in my heart of hearts that I was going to try as hard as I could to get this interview with Fidel Castro. I was working for ABC News at the time, and they said, if you really want to go, you can go. But we're going to have a plane standing by in Havana to whisk you back to Miami if you go into labor. And while most expectant moms will never deal with a situation like this, being pregnant does create other issues when it comes to style. Moms-to-be Lisa McCree and Cynthia Rowley know all too well. I can't even imagine if I was going to wear something little flowery with like a big white lacy collar or something, I don't know, so much of the maternity stuff out there is really scary. It's hard to pull it together, everything from your skin to your hair to um, every part of your body, including your feet. So whether you're expecting a baby or already have little ones at home, you most likely know what it means to be barely hanging in there, let alone looking chic. The most important thing about Mommy Chic is not letting them know how hard it really is. Coming up, the best clothes for the mom-to-be. It's definitely possible to be pregnant and be chic. And beauty tips for any mom. From mommy must-haves to time-saving tips, we'll show you a fitness routine that you might actually enjoy. Are you flying? Oh, Peyton, you're so heavy. And easy wardrobe pieces for any mom. Now, this is definitely not Mommy Chic when this on-style special continues. From George of the Jungle. He works incredibly hard. To Gods and Monsters. Oh boy, is he gorgeous. He's Hollywood's new hunk with an impressive body of work. He's going to be with us for the rest of our lives as a major actor. In an exclusive interview, Brendan Fraser reveals how he coped with sudden success. No, no pressure at all. Here, Brendan, here's a loincloth. <laughs> and offers insight into his passion for acting. I felt it like aching deep in my bones. Real stars, real stories. Brendan Fraser Celebrity Profile. This Wednesday at 8, only on E! This is the revolutionary Oral-B cross-action toothbrush. Its unique crisscross bristles penetrate to lift out and sweep away more plaque than any other brush. And clinical tests prove it.